there's some sort of transfer um, of knowledge and customs and culture. Um, what you see here um, are in the top left hand corner is a game called Go. Uh, it's played with the uh, white and uh, black rocks. Uh, it's a game of surrounding that was invented, uh, we believe, somewhere around 3 and uh, 400 BC. Uh, but the ones that other games that you see there are actually older. Um, the game in the top right represents uh, something called Senate uh, that actually um, we know for sure uh, was around by about 2600 BC. Uh, so over 4,000, almost 4,000 years ago. Um, the version that you see pictured there is from 1350 BC. So in the top right, that blue one. Uh, so that's in the middle of the, the time period when this game was being played. It's a racing game um, between the, the two sides running up and down. And then the bottom picture that you see there is the ancient game of Ur. Uh, that was played in Mesopotamia uh, sometime between 2400 and 500 BC. So really games have um, been around uh, almost forever as far as we know. Uh, these are the ones that have survived. Um, so that's really, you know, up to the imagination to know how far back they do go. Um, in the world of playing cards, what you'll see um, is there's a lot of um, some debate, I guess you can say, like where modern day playing cards came from, but they do uh, cross over. And so we're gonna think about um, cards in the state of just printing. Uh, it follows the path of invention for both uh, printing and paper uh, in general. Um, so paper has been around, you know, think about papyrus. Uh, so that goes back that almost thousands of years, woodblock paint, uh, printing, uh, which is the process of etching out, uh, art onto a piece of wood and then printing it on that paper. Uh, it was around 200 AD. So there's chance that there's something from that time period resembling some sort of cards, but really where it falls down to is, um, uh, in the, ancient uh, Chinese history around the Tang Dynasty, which is around 600 AD. That's when they started um, people use, uh, interacting, exchanging receipts for things, um, saying, I will give you blank amount of gold, or I will blank give you um, X amount of strings of gold, and a lot of that. Um, but it took another 400 years or so before the government in the Song Dynasty, um, that's around 1000 um, AD, started running out of money. And so they, rather than offering up money, they basically said, this is a, a note that's worth something else to be redeemed. So that's when people believe uh, the first true currency um, started in around 1023, I believe. Um, so what that is, um, is, you know, it's not just saying here's gold, it's saying this is something of value, it's to be exchanged for other things of value, and it really got the gears going. So what you see here is um, some of the, earliest indications or you know, representations of cards kind of uh, a few hundred years later, but what we think might be. So the, when a lot of people say, what was um, our playing cards, you'll see a reference to an, a Chinese emperor around um, sometime between uh, 11, around 1127 or so, who was playing something called the leaf game. Uh, and the partlet believes that the leaf game is actually uh, the rules to a drinking game, which is what you'll see in the top right hand corner. So it talks about how um, a, a, an emperor went out with his buddies one um, New Year's Eve and, and had a blast. Uh, so, you know, that's pretty much what we think the leaf game actually is. Uh, we talked about how money was being printed and what a lot of people um, suggest is that the paper money that was out there is actually what um, the Chinese would use as kind of playing cards because you'd have numbers etched on small pieces of paper uh, around the same size. Um, so I think that that's pretty interesting. Those cards that we see there on the left are, are from around 1500 or so. Um, so really the best guess of um, when playing cards started is sometime between that 1000 or so and definitely before 1294, uh, which is when in the Yuan Dynasty, we get the first mention of those playing cards. Um, so if anybody uh, remembers their history, the Yuan Dynasty is actually like the Mongol uh, version of China. So this is just after Genghis Khan took over. 
um, and then he, he basically took over the world from you know China all the way uh, to all the way uh, almost on the on the brink of getting into um, you know Europe. Uh, but he died, and his um, his wealth and all his riches and all his lands got split up between his um, sons and then grandsons. Uh, and, well, his, his grandsons actually it got passed over to his brother. So when the the grandsons held it, uh, you might have heard of Kublai. If you know Genghis Khan, you might know about Kub, uh, Kublai Khan. Uh, he was the Yuan emperor for a period of time, and this is the guy, um, Emperor Xingming Guangxiao, uh, who is the the guy that followed him at the time. Um, but in that um, decree, it was actually a, uh, we know for sure there was a case in 1294 about a couple of guys who were caught gambling and had the wood blocks to make more, more games for themselves. So uh, that's when we believe, you know, things kind of were invented and it really moved quite rapidly um, after that. The, what we see is the, um, the suits of the cards uh, have a real, um, a lot of similarities between them as they move through. And what you can see in that second step uh, after the Chinese is uh, called the Mamluks. Now the Mamluks were uh, these folks who were really quite, quite aggressive. They were, um, originally they were slaves who were brought up to be warriors in the uh, ancient Egypt. And the, um, basically ended up taking over um, just because they were so powerful, so well-trained um, right around the time of the Crusades. So what we see is uh, um, the similarities in the decks of European cards that we might consider, you know, the, the cards that we use on a daily basis, um, it most likely have those French, um, what are called indices on them, the diamonds, the hearts, the spades, and the clubs. Um, and you can see kind of how as you move back further where the um, similarities are between the different cultures um, that were there. So most people believe that those um, symbols come both from the Mamluks as well as representations of the kings and the queens. Cards have had different um, number of cards in the decks over time. Um, and so depending on the cultures that they're appearing in, um, they have different symbols as well. But the Chinese, um, sometime between in the 1400s, which you, what we're playing with were um, cash, strings of cash, myriads of strings, so packs of 10 of strings, and then tens of myriads. So um, those are their symbols. Uh, you have things like chalices, swords, cups, flowers. Um, these, these are the different symbols of the past that we would uh, see across all the different cards. And as they move through, you can kind of imagine people both trading, battling um, at different times oh, very quickly, right around uh, the 1200s, uh, 1300s or so. So that's when we think for the, as best as we can tell, they started to move through um, the different markets and places. So um, what you see here, you know, to kind of bring it a little bit more in line with what we, we associate with cards, um, these are the uh, different versions of European cards. Uh, on the left there is the oldest picture, we believe, of a, a, a jack with a uh, flower on it. Uh, you can actually, a coin, excuse me, um, that he's holding on to, and that's a symbol uh, for a card. But most decks are incomplete. What you see on the right, though, is one of the oldest decks um, that we know of, um, that, and it is the, supposedly the oldest deck that, um, ever, uh, that we have currently that's complete. Um, we believe it's somewhere from 1390 to 1410. And if you are in the local area um, and, it, you know, and when times change a little bit, you can go into the New York City. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art actually bought it. So uh, go check it out at the Met. It's a really beautiful um, deck that's in there. Um, a common uh, rumor that's out there is that playing cards have like an origin in different um, uh, people of historical significance, as they say in Bill and Ted, as, which we were watching last night. Um, but the, um, you know, in the 1500s or so, that actually did start to take off, but it doesn't have its roots in the cards. Um, so typically, uh, people will associate um, King David with the spades 
Alexander the Great with the clubs, Charlemagne with the hearts, and Julius Caesar with the diamonds. Um, and that's just like one example of them. So that comes and goes throughout cards, but really doesn't have much grounds uh, in modern day um, research, we believe. Um, so after that, once cards start coming through, we have the printing press in 1440 um, get produced, I believe. You know, business is good. You have people uh, producing cards. They become better and better well-known throughout uh, Europe. First mention was around 1377. So, you know, you can imagine um, as things are taking off and back to those suits, what we would have here is representations in different cultures. Um, and part of the reason of that is that people want to um, print the cards themselves. They, there's big money to be made in this. Um, King Charles, um, one of them in the French, uh, he bought a deck of, a tarot deck, I believe, in like 1390. It was embellished in gold. It was, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and, you know, but we did see that jack with the, the coin. So we do know that the, the common people are writing it. Most of the thing are playing it. Most of the things that are written about cards are from monks and different um, uh, legal um, language that we have out there where people are uh, getting taxed for them. That's really what um, this is uh, representing here on this slide. Um, that's a duty tax uh, stamp that you can see. Um, they go back as far as we know about 1588. In the case of England, 1588, Elizabeth I started taxing people in the 1700s. Um, there was a massive increase in the taxes uh, on cards and pin, uh, printers actually started forging stamps um, to show that they got, uh, that they had paid for it, even though um, the punishment, if you got caught doing that was death. Um, so the, the crowns knew that the cards, uh, the business of cards was big money and they had to pay uh, for their wars so, and explorations of the new world and whatnot. So this is something that um, people have always, you know, it goes back to before people even came here. Um, in, uh, you know, just kind of a note of, about English history there, one of the things I found interesting was that in 1828, uh, people started to actually purchase the cards themselves, the Ace of Spades in particular, that was the card that was uh, stamped and unique. And you'll notice that in modern decks, the Ace of Spades has uh, significance um, because there's only one in the deck and it's very um, uh, standalone. Uh, the, and, and something that they, they chose to, to mark. So in 1828, you actually had to buy the Ace of Spades for your deck from the commissioners of stamp duties to try to get uh, stop people from forging it. So you can make a deck that has every other card in it, uh, but if you don't have an Ace of Spades in there, obviously the deck is useless. Um, and so the, the powers that be um, made the people who were printing them uh, get one that was printed by uh, from the, the government. That stopped in around 1862. Now, uh, in terms of uh, taxes and stamps, um, you won't see that on the modern day cards that we play with if you buy them in the United States. Um, the last tax on, uh, on playing cards with, uh, that, where they had a unique stamp was uh, 1965. So um, in talking about what is American made, uh, you know, playing cards, how far they go back. Most things were imported, we believe, uh, in terms of playing cards, but uh, they started producing them locally uh, sometime in the late 1700s. Um, I believe the, the first person to set up shop is a gentleman by the name of uh, Jazaniah Ford he, out of the Boston area. This is a deck that um, he produced um, a few years later in 1824. Uh, we invited uh, Marquis de Lafayette, um, to um, tour America, um, but President Monroe had him over and uh, it was an opportunity for um, American merchants to create swag. And this was one of the, from one of the decks that he made. It's a really nice, this is again, the Ace of Spades. Um, so Jasonia Ford was kind of the forerunner for it. Um, he um, got passed a, a few years later uh, by a gentleman by the name of Lewis Cohen. Now Cohen, um, was, uh, got started um, with lead pencils, actually. Um, in the, and I believe he was in Europe um, with his brother doing that. Uh, came to the United States, got off the boat, saw that there was a, a boat full of lumber 
um, that was for sale for like a tenth of the price of what he can get it in England and convinced the ship's captain to um, ferry it back to England for him for free and started making these pencils for a ridiculously, you know, good margins for himself. Uh, and he rolled that experience in manufacturing into printing things. Um, so when he did that, he um, started publishing playing cards in uh, 1832. Um, and a few years later, again, this is a very smart guy. He started, he was the first to um, produce the printing process of, of adding all four car, uh, colors to the, the, the cards in a single press. Um, so it really cut down on the amount of time it took to produce the cards. And so you can see in those face cards down on the bottom, uh, you got blacks, you got blues, you got yellows, and you got reds all at once. Um, so the, he was Lewis Cohen. Again, he was really the, um, the top dog uh, for a number of years. In 1861, he gave it to his son. His son and his nephew um, incorporated the company as the New York Consolidated um, Card Company. Um, and that started to kick off the kind of the golden age of American playing card manufacturing. Um, in 1877, uh, what we um, saw, uh, a kind of a touch of the Americans, uh, is the Joker um, in the cards. I'm not sure if anybody here, is anybody here familiar with the game Euchre, uh, typically played in the Midwest? Oh, yeah. 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 So <laughs> Euchre is a, is a game uh, I recently started playing, uh, but it goes back. It's one of the oldest games that are out there. Uh, people think that Euchre actually is um, a, uh, kind of is where we get the word Joker, Joker um, and in German, I believe. So um, the Joker was meant as the uh, a card that would trump all other cards. Uh, the jacks in the uh, the suited jacks in, in euchre are the most powerful card, and the, the joker was made as kind of like a, a card that would even one up that. Um, so that's where those come from. And as you can see here in the cards, um, they these are the this is an early version. Uh, you'll notice there is not a number in each of the top corners, the indices. Um, that's a t um, a technique called a squeezer, um, which is from 1870. Uh, is um, I believe from 18, 1871 or so. Um, and that was an innovation where people didn't have to fan out the cards completely um, to see what they had in their hand. And that, so they, they, they call them squeezers because you can squeeze them in your hands. Uh, that's when the numbers are on the top right hand corner. Um, so that was kind of the early playing card um, industry that we would see. Uh, the folks that are um, kind of the top dogs now are from around that time. They are from a company called, uh, these guys called Russell Morgan & Co. is actually the, um, where their origins come from. That was started in 1867, I believe, is when they incorporated as a printing company. They bought the defunct Cincinnati Enquirer. Um, and then in 1881, they got a, um, a, somebody who really knew his stuff about playing cards. And they started um, producing, producing those cards. And they did so... Um, aggressively. Um, so in that way, they were actually able to undercut people uh, by almost 50, more than 50%. Their cards were much cheaper. Uh, and so they just started dominating. Um, 1885 um, is when they released the bicycle playing cards, which um, I'm guessing if you grabbed a deck in your house, you probably grabbed the, the bicycles. Um, there's a chance you bought coil um, or a few others. Um, but in that time, uh, in the late 1800s or so, these guys just started gobbling everybody up. So um, they bought that New York Consolidated Playing Card Company that we talked about earlier, the Standard Playing Card Company, uh, the people who make B, the people who make Tally Ho uh, in 1907, uh, the Aristocrat cards, Arrow cards. Um, it goes all the way up. Um, and they actually always acquire the game of the, the industry of playing cards itself is um, one of acquisition, it would seem. Um, they, they acquired Hoyle, which you might have. If you have plastic cards, they, they might be made of, by a company called Chem. Uh, they got those guys in 2004. Um, now, themselves, they operated on their own. In the late 60s, they were purchased, um, and they bounced around a few different folks, Diamond International, Self Run, Jardan, 
they were just recently with New L Corp, who um, just sold to a company called Cardamundi, who's based out of Belgium. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the history of playing cards themselves. Uh, I tried to truncate it as best as I can uh, from uh, early Chinese hit printing all the way to today, um, or, you know, most recently, I would say. Um, but in the world of, you know, to kind of bring it, transfer it over to cardistry just to set it up for you. Um, it has its history in um, magic uh, playing, you know, the, uh, different magicians would look for ways to um, fool people, make it look pretty, make it entertaining. And that's where uh, cards and uh, flourishes, different span, uh, fans that you can do with the cards. You can see here in the bottom right hand corner, um, you know, in Houdini's video um, poster, he has, he's doing a special cut. Um, and you know, it really stayed like this for a while. It was just cardistry. It was just part of being a magician, but people started to fidget with the cards, not necessarily do the magic itself. Um, and producing videos, uh, of them doing this type of work, uh, and, and performing for people live, uh, around the 1990s. Um, one of the things we're going to look at now is a quick video. Um, it's not mine. It's, it's sourced um, that I pulled from, but this is the like the best of cardistry from an event called Cardistry Con, which is a, a gathering of the people who who do participate in cardistry, and they're they're very good uh, for expectation setting. They are extremely better. They're much they're much higher level than I am, um, and I thought it would be cool just to kind of show you what people are doing. Uh, with cards these days. So I'm going to play this video. If you're interested, uh, the source information is below. Oh, excuse me. So you can see there, um, there's actually really cool music that goes over the top of this that's not playing right now, but you can just see these guys throwing the cards. It's really all about how a card looks in the air in motion uh, when it's fanned out. Um, these are tally hose guys spinning it on his finger, um, all sorts of different cuts, um, just extremely smooth um, and takes, takes a bit of practice, depends on what you're doing. Uh, the, and like I said, these guys are, I think from 2017 uh, or so doing some things with cards that I, I have personally no idea how they're doing, but sometimes making float. As you can see, a little bit of a reference to, to magic. And I think that most all of these these moves do have uh, a name of some sort, but honestly, I don't even know them. Uh, they, they, they're probably only be able to be done by a handful of people. Uh, that's a spring. It's a um, spring with a really beautiful triangle move in there. I could do the spring, but I can't do anything else. We'll show you how to do that. That was a good little flip. Uh, we could probably do that by the end of today. Probably not going to be able to pull this one off uh, by the end of today. But what you'll notice with these cards is that they're um, they're putting pressure points on the cards at different point at, and on different areas of the cards uh, to get the the rotation out of the cards, the spin, um, doing different things. So in this case, he's just holding the bottom really lightly and kind of letting it fan out after doing a special uh, shuffle called the Pharaoh Shuffle, which we'll do. Um, on the left there, you see an anaconda, uh, just a dribble. Um, now this one looks like it's cheating to me, but all right. So that's the pros. Um, and then let me, this is the different stuff that I've done. And now I'm gonna, what I'm gonna show you here is um, kind of a string of, of things that I've done in the past. Um, hopefully people are willing to share their video while we're doing the, um, 
and for the next half of the, the hour or so, so we can see what you're doing while you're practicing. If you want to have any, if you have any questions or anything like that, um, let me know what we'll be able to do. Also, um, if this does, if there are questions and whatnot, um, I can um, share my screen while we look at the video editing and, and go through these in slow motion. I also have another camera set up um, that's not currently running on my cell phone that I'll be able to show you kind of a different angle if it's not in the video. But for now, this is just like a quick five minutes um, and you can see uh, kind of what, what's out there and then we can go back to it. So um, hope you enjoy and again, not as good as these guys. Now, this is the Pharaoh Shuffle. What we're seeing here is um, uh, the two decks are split in half. What I'm doing is I'm pushing them evenly together. Uh, the thing I did wrong here is I put a lot of pressure on the cards on the top and the bottom. That's why I had to really kind of work them in there. Um, but it does lead, lead to this kind of cool effect where they're layered. And then when you fan them out, you can see the two different layer, um, the top and the bottom uh, levels associated with them. Um, this is it when they when they fan out a little bit cleaner after the shuffle. And that Pharaoh shuffle is something that um, you could do more than one thing with. Um, so there, this is called the waterfall. Um, this is the flower. Um, and it's just kind of letting it loose. This is, you know, moving on. This is a different type of fan called the pressure fan. Uh, when people say pick card, take card. Uh, and if you want to get really adventurous with it, uh, you can do it one-handed as well. Kind of span it out. Uh, this is called a, a ribbon fan. What's important here is that you add the equal amount of pressure on the cards as you fan them across the, the material. It also helps when the material that you're doing it on is um, similar to what you might see a couch, like a felt material. Um, of some sort. What that does is it gives you grip. If you try doing this on a normal table, uh, it won't work. Um, it'll, they'll just slide all over the place. You need a little bit of give. And as you can see here, uh, it's really just past the edge of the cards uh, that's coming through that I'm leaving. So that, that adds the, uh, the area it needs to lift one card after the other. Um, and I'm doing that with the, the, the third, the final card there on, the, on its edge. Now this is not uh, my favorite move uh, because it's it's pretty difficult for me. It's called the right, uh, right riffle shuffle. Uh, basically what we're doing here is we're just dribbling the cards, letting them fall and balancing it on your finger. Uh, that's pretty advanced. Uh, this one is the that flip that we talked about, um, the other guy doing. Uh, and basically what you're doing there is laying the cards across the top of your hand. Um, with holding it with your pointer finger and your pinky and kind of flicking down with your pinky uh, while keeping the card uh, levered across your pointer finger. This is a top shot. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm on the bottom of the video. Here's my thumb and on the top is my middle finger. They're both on the right side of the deck. Um, that's important there. This one is also a top shot. You'll notice my pinky coming across the top uh, and my pointer finger acting as a lever. Um, where it would fall against. This is a color change. Um, you can see it's a queen of diamonds. Now it's a jack of uh, clubs. This is a dove, uh, three of clubs, and now it's a king. And those two actually aren't the, the hardest things to do. And that's just a kind of a beginner throw. Now throwing, is this is kind of how I prefer to throw. This is fun. Uh, you can see I'm trying to get it on to, to hit that, um, get it in there, but it's not, <laughs> it doesn't actually ever do it. But you can see here, I'm holding the card um, with my pointer finger and middle finger across the top. And I'll show you on the other film, on the other camera after this, um, kind of the angle you want to hold it at and what you can expect. But it's, it's all in the wrist. Um, now with the sound, this one doesn't really work. That was a fake Rocky rendition I did. And if you get really good, you can uh, get Jedi powers with it. All right. So I'm going to open it up now. Um, if you want to unmute yourselves, 
uh, or Frank, do I do we have to do that individually on our end? I can't hear you. Frank, are you there or? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, yeah, everybody has to unmute themselves individually if they have questions. Okay. Does anybody have any questions that are out there? Does anybody? So what is the um, flex deck exactly? Oh, the flex deck is what I was, I've been using uh, in all of these um, video, all the different videos uh, of the work that I've been doing here. Uh, it's a deck of cards that combines dominoes, word games, um, card games all in one. Um, as you can see here, uh, you got the dominoes, the six of diamonds, and that's a letter I. Uh, basically, you can play anything you want with the flex deck. Thanks so much for the question. Where can I get a flex deck if, if I want one? Well, if you're in Stanford, they're available in uh, Lorca Coffee House. Um, and if you are a little bit further away, you can get them on Amazon.com or through our website. Uh, FlexDeckPlayingCards.com. Does anybody else have any questions? Or do you I say how we have any questions? Or do you I just want to make a comment of how genius you are, Michael oh. of FlexDeck. <laughs> Absolutely genius. Oh, thanks, Ma. And I'm very <laughs> proud of you. <laughs> Mike, do you have a favorite magician? Um, I think Chris Ramsey is a pretty, pretty cool dude. He shows it a lot. He has a lot of tutorials on um, cardistry uh, in general. He's a great place to start. Um, and he does some pretty nasty stuff. Chris Ramsey. Cool. Okay, anybody else? Do you guys want to like try any of these moves and then we can, if you have questions on how to do them, we can do that. We do have a little bit more time. Frank, I see a thumbs up. Were you able to get a deck? Yeah, I have one. All right. Did, you, did any of the moves uh, kind of stick out to you? Did you like the fans, the throws, the flicks? Yeah, whatever you want to show. Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, something that's not the kind of a good place to start um, is probably going to be, um, we could start with just the, um, the flick, uh, the, one of the color changes actually. So what I want you to do, and this is a, a quick, easy uh, magic trick. Um, grab, take two cards. All right, and now you can see my, um, my hand is in the bottom right-hand corner. It's holding the, two car, uh, the card. You see my pointer finger and the middle finger on the front. And then I want you to put your thumb behind it. Now I'm gonna do it in slow motion here. And I'm gonna go frame by frame. What you're gonna notice is I'm, if you just keep your eye on that, those two fingers in front, you'll notice that my, you see that movement there? My middle finger is sliding underneath my pointer finger. And what I'm doing is I'm keeping pressure on the card. So my thumb is on the back, the second card, and my pointer finger is on the first card. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that middle card and I'm gonna slide it underneath the front card, I'm gonna slide underneath the second card. And the goal here is to make it so that the, the card itself stays out of the view of the camera. Okay. So do you wanna just give that a shot? Do it slow. And do you see that movement of the cards when you do it? Here, let me actually 
Start video there. What you'll also notice here is that my kind of the add the the mo the movement to it. I bring my other hand and I flick it, and that's really just to kind of add some pizzazz to the move, and it hides the 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 sound of the cards transferring between each other. Now the other one, let me stop sharing. Oops. All right, so you can still see me now, but it's just me, right? Okay. So I'm gonna show you a different angle of it. So you keep the two fingers there, thumbs on this side, and it flicks behind the two. So you hold it. Now, Looking at the, the throw that we saw earlier, what we're gonna do is take your pointer finger and your middle finger and clasp the card in the top corner here. Hold it down, like so. Now when you hold it, you want it's all about your wrist here. So what you're gonna see is a flow, a motion like this, where you kind of like go from a flex through and then as your hand comes off, what's gonna happen is you're gonna kind of create that rotation in the card. And the rotation in the card and how you release the card is going to, um, it's gonna be what floats like a Frisbee. Uh, or if, you're, if you've ever, um, I'm trying to think what else. It's kind of like the, the opposite of if you, you know, when I skip a rock, my wrist kind of comes across this way and creates it so it's the the opposite motion or if you throw a frisbee that's a fun one and now that that card will go pretty much wherever whatever direction it is that you put um point in at the end for the most part how's that working for you frank kind of yeah getting some distance some distance no accuracy and it'll come and the more you put into it, the more you, you, you do like the, with your arm and, and, you know, on top of it, that'll get you more and more distance. Uh, accuracy is uh, pretty difficult. Um, you know, even for me, you can see um, it's not, it's not easy, but I would say if I'm throwing something in a bucket and I go through a whole deck, I might get like uh, one fifth of the cards in that are across the room. Um, so another one that we saw in there, um, that was a color change that I think is pretty easy to explain is when you're holding the deck and you run your hand over it, you saw the card color change. And what's happening with that is you're pulling the top card down with your pinky and pulling it in, into the motion. It's kind of a way. And what you're doing is you're hiding it with your hand. So it starts there and it goes there. So when you pop, you can see that, that flick and that movement and that change kind of going through. So that's how you do the two color changes. I think those are um, pretty, pretty quick and easy. You know, levering it across, um, leveling, using your, your fingers as levels to kind of push the cards in one direction or another um, really um, helps. Um, now we talked, we saw early in the video, the Faro fan with that. Again, you're gonna split the deck in half. You're gonna want it to line up as best as you can perfectly. Um, and then softly rub the, the decks together. And what you're looking for also is that, that give between the, the cards. And that gives you a per like really a perfect shuffle between them. Um, when you're coming through, um, tilting the cards a little bit in so they're just on the edge 
and pointing them down just a little bit while you rub them back and forth is what's going to allow the lips to kind of capture catch between each other. Does that make sense? Is that working out? And then once you get them in there and they start to go, depending on how far in you push, that's going to determine how your fan is going to look on the cards as you pull it. So if you push less, the higher the cards are going to be, but the harder it's going to be to get that fan going because the, the pressure, you're not, you don't have as much surface area on there. Um, let me see here. Throws. I think of oh, the top. Yeah, let's go back to that. Mm -hmm. So the one we saw earlier was a top shot where again, you're going to put your middle finger on the far end and your thumb down over here. You pull back that top card. So then there's an arch in it. You flip it. They're going to go all different directions and whatnot at first as you go, but as you do it more and more, you know, even with me right now, it's, it's something that you're going to want to get that, that same rotation that you're creating when you throw the card, you're going to be getting from that where your thumb is and making sure that it can clear your middle finger on the other side. Now the top shot that we saw, you know, that color change move where your hand is coming down and around. It's kind of a throw and that's where you get that. So if the, you're doing the color change, you're going to hold it there and it comes off here. With the throw, what you're doing is you're kind of giving it plenty of go of give to it. You can see it kind of pop off when I do it right. There's a bunch of them for us. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basic cardistry. Uh, you know, again, doing cool things with the deck um, as best we can. Um, I really think, you know, checking out the ribbon spread is a good way to kind of get started with things um, just because it's, you know, some of the easier things, the color changes, um, doing the, the, the shuffle itself um, will be basic building blocks for you. Um, one of the ones that I like to kind of just sit around and do um, is called a spring. Um, and with the spring, what we're doing here, so we're just going to hold the cards between our middle and pointer finger, and then your thumb down at the bottom. You're going to double the cards so they're nice, there's a nice curve to them. You get a nice kind of shot off with them. Now, when you do that, what's going to happen is the cards are going to bend in the direction. If you do it on the same color and side over and over again, that'll give it a, a real kind of forced bend without you even doing it. So in that case, you just want to turn the, the deck over and do it backwards. Now, what's happening with my left hand here is as I'm doing that, I'm trying to catch them, I'm really kind of creating a basket with my hand. So my um, pinky is down and out, and that's going to be where the cards actually fall into. My other fingers are, are kind of out wide to give myself as big of an area as possible. So I'm trying to see what the best angle is here. work every time but I think if you get that that pinky out um, it'll it, and it kind of helps create that that place where the, the cards will end up sitting when you're doing the spring and you get a little bit of direction on it as, as you get you know, more into it so the spring is one of those things that you can do anywhere you go anytime you just might have to pick up some cards um, but it's a good time and it's kind of something that's growing 
as the in the market you wouldn't necessarily think about uh, it would be but it seems to be uh, a strong niche that doesn't go away in the playing card industry so I want to thank everybody for being here today is there any other questions uh, that you might have for me I know we're a little bit early this was really great thank you all right good yeah thanks Mike thanks Dan hope everybody has a great weekend uh, did you want to change over and just do any sort of like other of your own tricks just kind of just show things off for the last few minutes oh goodness me um i'm not sure how what else i could do here i like you know this the spring is really one of those moves that you could just do over and over again and not really have much of a concern and to be honest with you i'm, I'm not the the best musician uh, magician i know um but so we got a ace eight of hearts here. And it's kind of tough to get it on the camera. So we get the eight of hearts. You'll see. Start. I'm trying to make sure it stays there. Nope. But that's a fun one. Where basically what you're doing with this deck, just to kind of give this one away too. If you take the cards and you Put them so it's just kind of off to the side of the pack like so and you raise this up high what will happen is as the card cards come down the air is going to push this one card up and flip over on top of the other ones so if you start the deck like above your head or a, a small sliver of the deck above your head like that just like so and then as you drop it what should happen is that card should change to the other side. So I think that that one's fun also, but I don't really have a routine with the cards here. <laughs> it's all about kind of just playing dominoes, playing word games, and then kind of fidgeting around with the deck and, and making those little videos that you guys saw a little, a little bit earlier. So, sorry, I don't have much more to add. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, and thank, thanks, Frank. Yep, and so we'll go into intermission. Our next session will be at one uh, fifteen, and it will be Everything is Not All Right Now, But Knitting Is with Kate Kostersky. So uh, please stick around for that. Thank you.